<laughs> okay, let's move on. Shh, 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 quiet, please. Um, now, here's what we did so far. We reviewed Newton's second and third law. And then, using that, we defined linear momentum and came up with an expression for conservation of linear momentum. Now, we're calling it linear momentum because later on, we're going to get to rotational motion, and there is a momentum called angular momentum. And it has a lot of the same kind of basic uh, ideas in angular momentum. But um, So we've got two kinds of momentum, angular and linear momentum. And we, we said, hey, Newton's second law says f equals ma. And we said, well, that's sort of true, as long as your mass is constant. And then we said Newton's third law, all objects interact with each other with equal and opposite forces. Okay, and so if we had some, you know, an, a system like this, we said, hey, these are equal and opposite forces, and they're net forces acting on those objects. So we can rewrite the equation like this. And then we can say, oh, okay, this is a net force, so that's MA, and this, this is MA. Well, what is acceleration? Well, that's dVdt. Well, what is, uh, so, so this is just a derivative, so I can put the M in there. And then I can, you know, take the, the derivative operator out and say, hey, this is true. And we go, whoa, this is, this is an amazing little expression here that we derived using Newton's second law and third law together. We use Newton's second and third law together to get this. And so we define this mass times velocity as momentum. And we said, hey, if I add the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two, and if those two objects are isolated from the rest of the universe, then the total momentum is, is constant. That is, the initial momentum of the system is equal to the final momentum of the system, as long as there's no net outside force acting on your system. Okay, so um, <laughs> that's what we, uh, what we did last time. Now, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, well, how can we use momentum if there is a net force acting on my system, okay? And when you have a net force acting on a system and it's changing the momentum of the object, we call that impulse. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna define impulse and we're going to also define uh, a very important idea in physics called the impulse momentum theorem. And it sound, it's kind of like the work energy theorem, but now it's the impulse momentum theorem. And we like to make these very fancy phrases so that we can impress our friends, right? I don't know, but my friends are really impressed when I bring up the impulse momentum theorem. Um, but so here's how we're going to start. Okay, we, we start with this. The force, the net force acting on an object is equal to the rate of change of momentum, okay, dp dt. Well, it's perfectly okay to rearrange this equation a little bit. It's perfectly okay to treat a derivative as a fraction. That's kind of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, let me do this. I'm gonna multiply, <laughs> sorry, I heard a groan of pain out there. Um, I can rearrange this. Just multiply both sides by dt. And I'll get this. A little tiny change in momentum is equal to a force, a net force, times a little tiny change in time. Okay, now if I integrate this so that I add up all the little tiny products of force times time, I integrate that I get here, when I add up all the little tiny changes in momentum, I get the total change in momentum, delta P. <coughs> and here I've got just F times time. And remember, force is a vector, but time is a scalar. And so this change in momentum is a vector. So th th here we have a product of a vector times a scalar and it gives me a vector. Now this is a change in momentum. 
okay? But what is this? This is force times time. So this is my net force times how much time I apply that net force. And if your net force is constant, this is just force times time, isn't it? I mean, if the force was a constant force, you could write like if F equals a constant, then you could say, oh, um, if the force is a constant, you could just say, oh, this is force times time. Anyway, force times time, or if, if force is a function of time, then you'd have to integrate it, but this is called impulse. Impulse is a product of force times time. Uh, change in momentum is a function of momentum. Now let's think about this in terms of units. A change in momentum is mass times velocity, that's kilograms times meters per second. And by the way, here's something I don't understand. Um, we, we've never named this collection of units. You know, like, like a kilogram meter squared per second squared is a is a, a joule or a kilogram meter per second squared is a newton but there's no name for a kilogram me, meter per second I, I think you know a lake would be good I've been lobbying for that for many years but no one seems to listen now what what units do we have for impulse well we have force times time that's newtons times seconds so what I like to do is if they ask for an impulse, I like to write the units as newtons seconds. Or if they ask for a, a change in momentum, I put the units in kilogram meters per second. But of course, they are the same. Because what is a newton? It's a kilogram meter per second squared. So that second squared cancels with the second here to give kilogram meters per second. So they're equivalent units. But here's what this is saying. If you apply a net force to an object for a period of time, you're going to change that object's momentum. So, and this, this right here, that, that, that uh, a change in momentum is exactly equal to the impulse applied to that object. That's called the impulse momentum theorem. Okay, that, um, that I'll, I'll rearrange this a little bit. F dt is equal to the change in momentum. This is a big idea. And this is called the impulse momentum theorem. Okay? And um, it is it is a big idea in physics. Now, uh, Look at right here. Uh, this is an integral, and the integral, um, if I if I want to look at it graphically, what I'm looking at here is um, the uh, the area underneath the graph. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention: in our book, they use a capital I with a vector hat on it to represent in impulse. Now, I usually don't bother with the capital I. I just write F dt. Uh, and the reason is, is that capital I is going to be used later on for rotational inertia. So students get confused. Um, but if you see a, ever see a capital I with a vector head on it, that means we're talking about impulse. But anyway, um, really what we've got here is we've got an integral. So I can look at this as the area underneath the graph. So here's force, and here's time. Now, what if I hit a, a, a baseball with a bat? You know, the World Series is going on right now. OK, go St. Louis. But anyway, the, the baseball, when it gets hit by the bat, it's a very small period of time, isn't it? And I'm sure if you could measure the force of the bat on the ball, the force of the bat on the ball would look something like this. It would start at zero, and then it would ramp up 
as the ball is really in contact now with the with the bat but then the ball starts to bounce it re re reaches its maximum force then the ball starts to rebound it starts to bounce off right and so it will come off the bat until it finally completely leaves the bat and takes off now this right here this area underneath this graph represents the impulse on the ball and therefore it's the change in momentum of the ball so force times time is equal to the change in momentum of the ball now if you're talking about a baseball and a bat uh, this change in momentum is going to be pretty big because the ball might be coming towards the bat at like you know 95 miles an hour whatever that is in meters per second then it hits it hits the bat it, may, it might come off the bat at 120 130 miles per hour so it's a big big change in momentum so that, that's going to require a force now do you want the force uh, now if, if this is a very tiny amount of time this force is going to be huge whereas if you have a, a, um, a very uh, if you have a lot of time if the force is spread out over a lot of time you won't need as big a force now I, I want to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here in a second but um, one thing to realize is that this is why uh, you should wear your seat belts folks in your car because here's what the seat belts do the seat belts actually stretch in a car crash have you ever seen like a crash dummy in a video those seat belts which look very tight and if you pull on them they don't, they don't seem to have much give to them but they have a lot of give to them when the force is high enough seat belts the fabric of seat belts is designed to stretch and what they do is they stretch out the amount of time that you have to apply that force to change your momentum and because of that the force the magnitude of the force is much less now if you're going to use the windshield of the car to try to stop your body okay you're going to stop uh, you're going to have the same change in momentum to stop your body but in a very little short amount of time and so, th so therefore you need a very very high force and high forces are not good for the body this is why you wear a helmet if you ride a bike or a motorcycle twice in my life I have crashed my bike uh, on my bike pretty hard and hit my head hard on the pavement twice I was uh, both times I was wearing my helmet and what does a helmet do it increases the time of contact between my you know it, it gives time for my head to crush in to that uh, to the ground yeah and therefore the force is a lot less now it still hurt remember the one crash I had I, I saw stars I had a little bit of a concussion but if I hadn't been wearing that helmet I probably would have been knocked out and who knows so um, you know you can't fight the laws of physics but you can you can use the laws of physics to your advantage if you're willing to wear a helmet put on those seat belts it's all about impulse momentum theorem. Okay, so uh, what I'd like you to do uh, now is um, try example four on uh, page. Huh? Oh yeah, we do need a whiteboard. Well, try it uh, when you get home. <laughs> all right. So that's it for today.